Well, good evening everyone. Michael Soothing here. Actually, this isn't my Michael Soothing channel. This is my ASMR Theology channel, so I should say Michael Theology. Let's recap part two and the final part of our exciting story of Esther, but we'll make it relaxing as well. Uh, just for a quick summary of where we are so far, Esther is a book, the only book in the Bible where God is not mentioned. However, God is always at work, bringing about a desired result. We have the Persian Empire, King Xerxes, the greatest king of his day, ruling over the greatest empire of his day, and that empire in those times stretched from Egypt, encompassed all of Egypt, all the way up to Macedonia, and uh, all of the near and far east that was important for trade, going all the way out here to India through Persia, Persian Empire, and encompassed the trade routes also, including the maritime routes, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf. You could go to the Far East from there. Very wealthy. So he had a big party to show off his wealth and all that he had and brought people from all 127 provinces. He wanted to show off his queen, Queen Vashti, probably in a strict state of partial undress, and she refused. This was after seven straight days of non-stop drinking, of course, um, at this big banquet. Drinking out of giant gold cups like that. Wine. So whatever, dozens or hundreds of his nobles and officials and so forth, Vashti refused. So he deposed her and said, you're banished. And he needed a new queen. This was in his outdoor garden, which had pools of water and so forth. Looked a bit like this, right? So they hold a beauty contest throughout the whole Persian Empire. And there's a guy named Mordecai who has an adopted daughter uh, whose name is Esther. Hadassah was her Jewish name, but her Persian name is Esther. So she wins the regional beauty contest, and she wins the main beauty contest at Susa, and King Xerxes makes her the queen, right? So here she is, getting all fixed up, and uh, to go before the king and as a part of the beauty contest. Oh, well, we're not ready for that one yet. Don't look. But I'll explain it in a minute. Okay, so where we left off was the evil right-hand man of King Xerxes was a guy named Haman. Even his name sounds a little bit evil, doesn't it? Haman. And Haman had plotted because Mordecai would not bow down to him, wouldn't get on his knees like everyone else was commanded to do and uh, salute him as basically deity. Mordecai would really only be getting on his knees for God. It's not in the text, but we know that. And so uh, he wanted to kill Mordecai. He was so offended. And the entire nation of the Jews that were living in exile in Persia throughout the provinces. So Mordecai sends word to his adopted daughter, Esther, now, nobody knows that Esther is Jewish because Mordecai told her to keep it a big secret. Um, he wanted her to win that beauty contest and have a chance at the throne as the queen. So she had won. When he finds out about this plot, he sends word to Esther and says, Esther, you've got to help your people or they're all going to be killed. You've got to go before the king and plead our case. But Esther sends word back and says, through the messenger, and says, I can't do that. 
The king hasn't even summoned me for thirty days now. Besides which, if you go into the king's courtyard without being invited, it's the death sentence automatically by law, unless the king holds out the golden scepter to you. Pretend this is a golden scepter. It doesn't look very golden, does it? But we'll pretend it's a golden scepter. So that's where we left off. Um, oh, not quite. So Mordecai sends word back to Esther again and says, Look, don't think you're going to get out of this because you're the queen. Because now Haman has written it as law that all Jews must be killed on a certain day. That day was determined by a role of the poor, the dice from which modern-day Purim comes. In any case, uh, he's, she said, uh, yeah, Mordecai says to Esther, sends her a copy of the law and says, you're going to be subject to this as well because you're a Jew and the law cannot be broken once it's signed, sealed by the signet ring. So Esther says, all right, here's the deal then, Mordecai. Fast for me for three days, you and all the others, and I'll do the same along with my maidens. Then I'll go before the king, and if I die, I die. So Esther's got a lot of bravery in her at this point, and she's decided she's going to put herself out there. Mordecai had said, perhaps God brought you to royalty just for such a time as this. It was scary times, kind of like we're in now. So that's where we left off. All right, so what happens next? Um, Esther goes into the king and decides to go ahead and do uh, this very, very risky venture. She goes before the king, and let's read what happens and what she says. Out of chapter 5. Okay. On the third day, Esther, this is after fasting, Esther put on her royal robe and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and he held out the golden scepter to her and said, approach, instead of, you're, you're now going to be killed. Much better to be have the golden scepter than to uh, get the death sentence. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half of my kingdom it will be given to you. Very generous on the part of the king. He must have loved Esther quite a bit. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, the evil, evil Haman, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet that I have prepared for you. Bring Haman at once, the king said. He's thinking, wow, cool, another party where we can drink wine. So, uh, and go to this banquet. He knows that's not Esther's real request. She's got to, you know, do this right and build up a little bit. Build up her courage and set the stage properly. So they go to the banquet, and the king, as they were drinking wine, it says in the text, maybe she wanted to soften him up a little bit with some sips of wine, right? So maybe that would make him a little more receptive to what she had to say. He says to the king, says to Esther, Now what is your petition? Up to half the kingdom it will be given to you. What is your request, and it will be granted? Esther was still not quite ready to uh, come forth with 
what was on her mind. So she says to the king, My petition and request is this. If you, the king, regard me with favor, and it pleases the king to grant my petition, then let the king and Haman come again tomorrow to a banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Interesting. Now she's really set it up and made the king curious, of course, what's going to happen. Meanwhile, back at the gates of the city, uh, Haman went out that day from the banquet, totally happy and in high spirits. He's thinking, wow, of all the people in the kingdom, the king and the queen invite me to the special VIP banquet. Not only today, but again tomorrow. So he's thrilled, thinking, I'm really the top dog, right? But then when he went by Mordecai, he was furious, because once again, Mordecai would not bend the knee. So he goes home, and um, he's boasting about his wealth and so forth to his friends and his wife, and how great he is, and he says, and on top of that, I am the only person, it says here in chapter 5, who Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she invited me to come again tomorrow to a special banquet with the king. But all of this, in spite of being the second top dog in the biggest and most important wealthiest and strongest empire existing at the time. In spite of that, and in spite of all these other things, he's become unhappy after he left. Why, he says? Um, but I can find no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate, unwilling to bow to me, right? So Haman's wife Zeresh and his friend said to him, we got an idea for you that'll make you feel better. Build a gallows 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Uh, and then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. Of course, nobody knows that Esther is Mordecai's adopted daughter and also a cousin by blood, by the way. Now, this suggestion of building a gallows to murder Mordecai on delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built that very evening. Remember, he is a top guy, so he has the power uh, to get this done with a large team of craftsmen, right? Now that very night, the king couldn't sleep. He's tossing and he's turning. He has this problem often. But I'm wondering if God may have given him uh, insomnia that night. So he's tossing and turning. And his solution for this, my solution is ASMR, right? And maybe that's yours and that's why you're watching. But... Um, my solution is ASMR or listening to a heavy water sound like waterfall or a heavy rainstorm, which I have recordings of. Anyway, his solution, his ASMR is for the king is to have the scrolls, the books brought out and read to him. Maybe someone would read it to him in an ASMR voice. That's probably what would happen. So I don't know who was doing the reading, but they brought it out. So they're reading this, and remember in part one of this two-part series, I said that Mordecai had saved the king's life because he uncovered a plot against the king and told him about it. So they're reading this thing they're reading the uh, chronicles. King had like a diary and official chronicles. 
and they picked a day and they're reading to him from these chronicles of daily activity and they happen to be reading the story about Mordecai and the two plotters they read it to the king and he says um, well what recognition did we give to this guy Mordecai who did this and saved my life and they said well we didn't really do anything for him and he says nothing has been done um, we need to do something to honor this guy now it's early morning right and Haman has come to ask if he can hang Mordecai on the gallows that's what his wife and friends said he should do right so Haman's out there and the king says who is standing in my outer court and they said it is Haman so the king says bring him in so Haman enters and the king says to him what should be done for the man that the king delights to honor and Haman's thinking hmm well who in all the kingdom wouldn't the king want to honor more than me Haman of course that's what he's thinking because he's an egotistical guy right let's see how it is worded in the text Haman thought to himself who is there the king would rather honor than me all right so he says to the king for the man the king delights to honor have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn himself and a horse that the king has ridden and put a royal crest on its head let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes and let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse throughout all the city streets proclaiming before him to everyone this is what is being done for the man that the king delights to honor Haman's thinking what better than for my bloated ego than to ride all over the city having someone proclaim how great I am and how I should be honored by the king right little does he know however what the king's going to reply because the king says Haman's going to have a very bad day here the king says go at once he commanded Haman get that robe and the horse and do just what you suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate and do not neglect anything you have recommended you're the one to lead him around that's where we are in the story now there's Haman leading Mordecai the Jew around proclaiming his uh, honor by the king Mordecai must have wanted to puke at this point um, so anyway where do we go from here when he gets home he's very upset needless to say that is Haman he gets home and he rushes with his head covered in grief he tells Zeresh his wife and all his friends all that happened to him and his advisors and his wife said to him nice wife and nice advisors that they are they say to him since Mordecai before whom your downfall has started is of Jewish origin and the king didn't know that either right you cannot stand against him you will surely come to ruin and while they were still talking with him the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet that Esther had prepared now it's the next day sip of water not wine from a giant golden goblin I'm sorry to say all right so now we're getting down to it what is Esther's request going to be to the king so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther and as they were drinking wine on the second day the king again asked Queen Esther what is your petition and your request it will be given you even up to half my 
kingdom will be granted to you. And then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. Spare my life. The king must have been shocked to hear this. And spare my people. This is my request. Because I and all of my people have been sold for destruction, for slaughter, and for annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would keep quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. She's being quite diplomatic. So King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Who is this person who says you should all be destroyed? Where is the man who had dared do such a thing? And Queen Esther says the adversary and enemy is this vile Haman sitting right there across the table. Let's take a peek at where at Esther accusing Haman. There she is. There's the king. Look at Haman. He doesn't look too thrilled now, does he? All right, so Haman was terrified before the king and queen and the king got up in a rage, in a rage. And he left his wine, and he went out into the palace garden. He was so angry, he didn't want to respond yet. He probably couldn't even speak, he was so angry, when he heard that his right-hand man, his most trusted advisor, second in command of the kingdom, had plotted to have his own wife and queen killed and all her people, all because of his bitterness over Mordecai, right? But Haman, realizing the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Um, so just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining grabbing onto her and begging her, right? And the king exclaimed, Will this Haman even molest the queen while she is here with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said, A gallows 75 feet high was built to hang Mordecai and stands by Haman's house. He made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help you, king, and save your life from the plotters before. Apparently, this Haman guy is not too well liked by others in the king's court, since that guy was quick to speak up and say, by the way, king, uh, you know, this Haman dude, he built a gallows for Mordecai Maybe you could hang him on it, right? So the king said, hang him on those gallows. So they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. Wow. Yeah, so you see the twists and turns and the irony. You couldn't even write a plot like this if you try. But these things were recorded not just in the biblical text, by the way. Um, but that still leaves a problem, doesn't it? When the king issues a law, which had been done by Haman, and signed with the king's signet ring, to kill all the Jews on a certain day, which was upcoming soon, um, that law had to be followed. It could not be reversed by the king under Persian law. So what's going to happen? Well, the king doesn't know what to do about this. So he turns it over to Esther and Mordecai. He elevates Mordecai to the advisor position. So
since he was so pleased with him and wanted to honor him. So what Esther says is, I tell you what, King, she comes up with the idea, or maybe it was her and Mordecai collaborating, but in any case they said, you can't reverse the old law we understand, but you could issue a new law, and in that law you could say, the Jews are allowed to protect themselves from anyone who comes and attacks them on that day. So this new law gets sent, and the king was pleased with this. So the new law gets sent throughout all of the land and all the 127 provinces. They had a system kind of like the Pony Express. They would take a decree and a horse would run at a full gallop. And then there would be a relay point, say 100 miles away or something. 50 miles, whatever. And at that point, they would then relay it over to a fresh rider and a fresh horse, and that would continue on. Like the Pony Express of the Wild West, they could get decrees out among the land very quickly that way. So they send out this decree, and most of the people were smart enough to know, once they saw the second decree, we better just leave the Jews alone. But there were some attacks on the Jews, and those people that attacked were all killed and quickly made, uh, you know, quelled that, uh, that annihilation that was planned. It says the number of those slain on the same day, it gives the numbers and so forth. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, destroying them and destroyed those who hated them. That's in chapter 9. So, that day, instead of becoming the day of annihilation, became a day of feast and celebration. That is the feast of Pur or Purim. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. If you're Jewish, you tell me. All right, so Purim was celebrated. From that day until now, and remember this was how long ago? It was 2,500 years ago, roughly speaking. So, um, yeah, ever since, every year. So Purim would be celebrated from then on every generation, by every family, in every province, and in every city. And the days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in all 127 provinces. Words of goodwill and assurance from Xerxes the king. And the final chapter, I'll read you the final chapter, which is chapter 10. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire in its distant shores and all his acts and power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, to which the king had raised him, second in command now, uh, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes. Presentment among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all of the Jews. Very interesting end. And later on, a number of those Jews return to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and the city and the temple and so forth. And this set the stage for that. Let's see what else we can talk about. At the end of this story, there's the pur, the, the dice, the form of dice they use to determine the day. 
Haman wanted to determine that day for annihilation, but God determined it to be the salvation of the Jews. And Esther's decree confirmed these regulations and it was written down in the records permanently, the records of the Medes and the Persians. And finally, what we, how can we sum this up? We live in tough times. You know, Esther was just a nobody. Um, no mother and no father. Adopted father Mordecai, but ended up winning a beauty contest and became queen over the most important empire of its day. And used that position, put her life in jeopardy to bring about a great salvation for the Jews. Now, you and I may not be queen, especially me, over the Persian Empire, but you never know what God has raised you up for in the time and place in which he has put you. So, for me, we have tough times with the COVID virus, with all of the unrest going on in the country and in the world. Let's use that in some positive way to bring about a good result. If you're an unbeliever, you might consider whether God's tugging at you and um, asking you to join his kingdom. And if you're a believer, you might consider whether there's someone you can help or some purpose God's been calling you to do during the time you were in lockdown or quarantine or dealing with some of the tough things that have been going on in the country, right? So I, uh, God's plan of salvation for all of humanity works its way through the Old Testament. And it's not easy to get through the entire text of every book and understand them all. But if you do a deep study, you eventually see how the plan of salvation unfolds throughout human history, recorded human history. And if we go to the very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, um, Jesus says, as he's speaking to the churches of the day, he says to the churches, where is the passage I want to find? He's talking to the church of Laodicea which has become extremely wealthy. And he says to them, these are the words that I say from the angel to the church in Laodicea, write this. I know your deeds. You're not either cold or hot. I wish you were one of it or the other. Because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and I don't need anything right? But you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful, poor and blind and naked. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you will cover yourself and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. He's speaking of metaphor, of course. He's speaking of accepting him into their life so they'll have spiritual riches in eternity which outweigh by a few trillion times a few trillion whatever wealth they had here that's what he's explaining to them and finally he says you may have heard this passage before behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That's Jesus' final invitation in the book of Revelation to all of us. Esther played a small part in that unfolding plan of man's salvation that came first through the Jewish nation and then through Jesus himself. And so, consider, what is God's plan for you? Maybe he brought you to a time, just such a time as this, as Mordecai said to Esther, as he has with me. He put it on my heart 
to start making these videos. What has he laid on yours? Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good and pleasant week. And until next time, don't ASMR and drive. Bye-bye.